Welcome, everyone. Part of my deal with Mike Couché is that if I ever feel sufficiently strongly about a guest, I get to introduce him or her. Uh, Mike has had terrific guests this semester, but uh, I nonetheless have not exercised the prerogative since last semester. Uh, but today I want to do so because we are truly privileged to have with us Father Weil, the president of the university. He requires the uh -huh. introduction, I would think, in this crowd, uh, not least because I'm sure that all of you have committed to memory the uh, eight or 10 or 25 or however long page uh, conversation that we printed with Father Wild uh, in the most recent issue <coughs> of the Marquette Lawyer. Um, <coughs> say that for the benefit <coughs> of my OMC colleagues who are just scandalized by the length of the things that we published in the Marquette Lawyer magazine. Um, uh, the notion that people might actually read things of such length, uh, I guess, is foreign perhaps in uh, some disciplines these days. Not so in the law. Um, uh, another part of my deal, and Mike doesn't know this, is that uh, I also get to uh, wrap up so I do have one other thing uh, uh, that I'm going that to say. That sounds like a rebuttal. Uh, uh, but I'm going to wait until the end. Uh, it is entirely uh, independent of the content. Uh, it is not uh, in any sense going to be a rebuttal. But please join me in welcoming the president of the university. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. I'll be careful. Um, thanks, for all of, uh, thanks to all of you for coming today. It's uh, good to be with you again. Uh, thank you for being with us, Father. We appreciate you taking your time today. Absolutely. I'm delighted to be part of this. I wanted to begin by talking about uh, the hopes and dreams you have for this university and where Marquette figures in terms of uh, a national institution and, and, and what you see coming in the next uh, five to ten years for this university. Well, uh, when I first became president, I set forth uh, three things that I thought were essential uh, for where we would go, there, I suppose, no particular surprise that we'd uh, pay uh, closer attention and be sure that we actualize our Catholic Jesuit mission and the, you know, the, the accompanying values that we talk a lot about, excellence, faith, leadership, and service, and do that in ways appropriate to the different areas of the university, but uh, that would be the first thing. The second is the obvious one of trying to raise academic quality because at the end of the day, uh, it's the learning experience that people have and the advancement of knowledge that really measures what a university is about. And the third thing is probably the most obvious of all, that we have a strong uh, financial foot we place the institution on a str ever stronger financial footing uh, those three things are are fairly obvious we made progress uh, and I think uh, when it comes to mission uh, a lot of that is getting people to buy into it and it's not a matter of compelling people uh, particularly it's not a matter of compelling faculty it's winning hearts and minds. People have to see that somehow this is an enhancement uh, for their work environment and become themselves uh, promoters uh, and in, in a ways appropriate to their own specific work. Uh, as far as academic quality, it's a constant movement area by area. We have ambitions for this university. Uh, we see ourselves, we're currently ranked, you know, roughly in the, somewhere in the 80s, the low 80s of the uh, national universities, which is kind of the big leagues of, of this business. Uh, rankings by themselves are not everything. Uh, there's been some good comments actually made by some in this room about, you know, you've got to balance that off against mission and uh, the kind of our historical purpose, and I think uh, the 125th helped us to focus a bit more on that. Uh, but uh, we certainly need to make financial progress, and, and I've said very clearly we need to reach the billion dollar level in endowment. We're closing in on 400 million, we got a ways to go, uh, but that's clearly a task in front of us. These are not dramatic things. They're, they don't constitute any sort of dramatic change. 
in direction for the university. We do definitely have to scan the horizon. The horizon is, is a, an ever-changing reality. Uh, we're going to be seeing more online uh, efforts in education, including at the higher education level. Uh, we're going to uh, need, as a more diverse society, to uh, uh, pay attention to that, but it's, we also see that as very mission-driven. And the diversity is not simply ethnic racial diversity, it's also uh, diversity, economic diversity. <clears throat> Keeping the institution affordable, uh, and that's a real challenge. And that's why we're going to concentrate on heavily on, on endowment for student aid. God bless Joe Zilber with his $25 million <laughs> gift for scholarships for students at this part of the university. That's terrific. But we need to do that uh, and keep working on that. And the working goal at present is about 250 million. But nobody's going to complain of that number if we overrun that number substantially, because that's definitely something we need to work on. I want to follow up on a number of the things you mentioned, but, but let me begin with sort of a basic question. I think this university has talked about being known nationally as one of the best Catholic institutions in this country. Do you think Marquette has that reputation today? I think we're right up there. Uh, you know you can argue whether we're fourth, fifth, sixth. I expect the first three places are more or less claimed for the moment. I keep a constant eye on Boston College. <laughs> <clears throat> because uh, if there's an institution that's like us in many ways, that has achieved significant development, I mean, beyond anything people would have expected. They were a local, Eastern Massachusetts University, uh, as late as the early 1970s. They had started to make a move to become a national institution, but they were definitely a local institution. Their older alums uh, are heavily people that grew up in that part of Massachusetts and very nearby. Uh, so it's a, it's a great success story. They're serious about their uh, identity as a Jesuit institution. They are certainly working on academic quality, and they, they, need to, they have areas they need to work on. And they've certainly made progress in building their uh, financial uh, wherewithal. And, uh, but it's, it seems the institution, most like us, uh, and if you ask me where we should be going, I think that's somewhere uh, in that same vicinity is where we should be aiming. Uh, that, I feel pretty strongly about that. Do you see Marquette <clears throat> being a, uh, an institution driven more in the future by research, or, or will it be a teaching institution that does research, if, if I'm clear on that question? Yeah, I mean, we've tended to argue for a balance. Teach the teacher-scholar model. I'm not sure we should change that. There are those who say you should clearly become a research institution that does good teaching. But the research institutions that I know, an awful lot of people, that's where their world is, if, uh, the people on the faculty. And uh, my own view is it's a both-hand uh, proposition. Faculty are expected to be serious about research, to publish, to be players in their discipline, uh, and they're expected to be uh, committed, uh, good teachers, committed to their students. Is that possible? I think there's a lot of faculty here who do just that and do it extremely well. There are areas of the university where we have to work more on inculcating, uh, more typically the issue would be the, the research side of it. We certainly need to support our faculty well in terms of their research and do better than we're presently doing. Uh, that too, I think, will be we're working to address. And we need to keep working to raise the quality of the faculty. Uh, faculty chairs have really, where we've been, it been able to bring them in and, and, and do the kind of hire that we want, that's made a powerful impact. The finance. Uh, department and the School of Business is a good example of a place that's really been energized uh, by recent faculty appointments. I think the same thing's going to happen in engineering with uh, now three new chairs that uh, 
uh, they're putting in place, but we're talking about this, doing this sort of thing, creating funds to support research and, you know, you know building endowment. That's, endowment sounds abstract, but endowment <clears throat> translates into financial aid for students and support for faculty. That's the, the most primary thing you do with university endowments. Now, if we can get some uh, endowment for athletics, that would be fine, too. <laughs> Let's talk about affordability because I know in, in other uh, public comments you, you have you've talked a great deal about that. That it's really all about affordability. That students can afford to come to Marquette to get the kind of education that we have just talked about. Uh, how concerned are you about affordability at this moment in time, and, and about having the amount of financial aid that you need to to keep the school affordable to middle class kids? Oh, I think that is a huge challenge, and that's, of course, why we're talking about significant push on financial aid, endowed financial aid, because students, the affordability issues are large. Some families can write the check without any pain or struggle, and they should be asked to do so. Other families, uh, particularly if you come from a low-income situation, inner city and whatnot, you're going to need a tremendous amount of financial aid. If you're first generation collegian in this environment, uh, whether you go to public institution or private, you're going to need a tremendous amount of financial aid. Your children won't need as much because you're, when we educate you, your life and your, that of your children and your grandchildren will be forever changed. I mean, that was the original founding vision of this school by uh, who as Archbishop Henney kept nagging the Jesuits to get on with it. He wanted a college, and he wanted it as early as 1848, a college for the immigrants that were streaming in to the city of Milwaukee and the surrounding area. And he saw that as a way to give these immigrants, many of whom, but of course certainly not all of whom were Catholic, uh, this would give them an opportunity to participate in a in a in a more powerful way in uh, in all that American society means, and that's that's all the more true at our point in time. So there was tremendous vision behind that. I think it's still got some powerful impetus for this institution, uh, but it is expensive, uh, and so that's that's the reality. So yes, we do have to work on that very hard. We have to try to control tuition increases as best we can. But the reality is it's a labor intensive industry. We have many of the challenges that you have in the healthcare industry. Uh, and um, while we've certainly worked to cut costs and we have to continue to do that, uh, you got to be careful what you're doing when you, you know, you, you're, the issue is at the end of the day, you want to end up with stronger quality, not weaker quality. <clears throat> Spend a couple of moments on diversity. Uh, I know this is an ongoing effort on the part of the university. Are you satisfied with where you are? Uh, where would you like to be? Uh, we are currently, uh, just to use the freshman undergraduate benchmark, uh, about 15%. And that was a little higher, 17% the year before. Uh, we, I think, have the potential to do better than that, and I think it would be a good idea to do better. We're also working to establish uh, pipelines with a variety of schools that we think uh, are doing a great job and will give us students, uh, Crystal Ray Chicago is an outstanding example of this, will give us students well prepared to uh, benefit from market education. We're looking candidly for, it, we, and we've had a lot of talks about this with the, uh, with the Board of Trustees and we will have more. You know, what's the right kind of uh, admission strategy for the university? Uh, should we push entirely on academic quality? Well, no. Should we push uh, keep pushing on academic quality. Yeah, absolutely. That's important. And it's demeaning to, to when you talk about diversity to assume that somehow this is an issue that will prevent diversity. You may need initially to provide support for those students, 
uh, you have to support all freshmen when they arrive. Different groups of freshmen need different sorts of support. Uh, but uh, the notion that we would do that, uh, you know, especially for first generation collegians, sure. I mean, we want them to succeed. That's the whole point of it. Uh, but, but certainly people need when they're first generation, because that's the real issue. It's not ethnic racial diversity. It's whether you're first generation. And uh, we in the present freshman class uh, were about 23% the year before, about 26% first generation. Now, I'm going to tell you, when I heard that number initially, that astounded me. Uh, and yet, now we're starting to hear that number. Madison is 20% uh, in their freshman class. Uh, those are the, that's where your cost structure is. And so, but on the other hand, if I'm, uh, you know, from a middle class situation and I'm uh, African American or Hispanic, the number of options that are out there, really good options, are terrific. Uh, and why, if you're a head of family, you're going to say, well, go for it. Uh, so we obviously are interested in making Marquette more of a destination for that group of families and for all families. That's the academic quality part. Uh, but uh, we also think that we have a pretty good track record in educating over a century and a quarter uh, people from um, rather modest means. And we see that as part of the mission. And those, we're looking for people because the, if you're first generation, you got some fire in the belly. You got a desire to make something of your future. You may not have had the best training because of the limitations of the schooling you had, but if you've got the talent, cream will rise to the top. That's habitually our experience. We just want to encourage it to make that happen. We want students to graduate. We've had terrific record, I think. For example, our EOP is, is the oldest educational opportunity program we think in the country. And we've had a terrific graduation record with that. Um, <clears throat> we've read a lot recently about UWM and, and its efforts to become more of a entrepreneurial university, and yet there are efforts going on within this university uh, that probably would be a good subject for discussion. Um, how does Marquette perceive itself in, in that context? Do you, do you see yourself as an economic engine for this region? Not in the same way. I think our first task is to educate the future leaders in the various professions. Because it's those leaders who will, I think, be the, uh, the future entrepreneurs, uh, the future uh, professionals that this country needs. That's our, I think that's our core mission. Interestingly, one of the great discoveries that I've made uh, as president is the huge number of entrepreneurs that have graduated from this institution. I've joked that there seems to be something in the water that creates it because, uh, you know, I'm not sure that it's, that we could easily articulate why that is so, but that it is so is to me evident. Uh, and interestingly, I think all of the large gifts that we've received uh, come ultimately from entrepreneurs. Um, and so that's a very striking phenomenon as well. But uh, that is true. So I think that's a little different. On the other hand, we are getting more savvy with, in terms of tech transfer. Uh, if we do want to promote good research, uh, but it's le we're we're not going to I think tell our faculty, you know your job your life depends on uh, produ you know, getting patents and producing uh, research that actually is commercializable, because there's a happenstance to that, and that's true at Madison as well as anywhere else. Uh, if you've got a, a large enough pool of people working on research, sooner or later ideas emerge. Uh, we obviously want to create an environment uh, where we, that can happen here. We're, in, we're up at the same time a smaller institution. 
Uh, but uh, it, we wouldn't see that at the heart of our mission in the same way that I think m many of the public institutions across the country, partly to justify themselves in the public arena, uh, say we have to focus on research, tech transfer, uh, job and uh, uh, job creation and, and the uh, creation of new enterprises. Uh, that I think is has got to be, particularly in this climate, uh, part of their mission as educational institutions. And it's not an unimportant mission. We can't do everything. We can do some of that, but we're not going to be the, I don't think we have the same uh, tasks or aspirations that, say, uh, the flagship state institutions necessarily have. A couple of more quick questions, <clears throat> and then we'll open it up uh, to your questions. Uh, I want to talk about safety uh, on campus because uh, all of us remember days uh, not too long ago where uh, that was an image issue for Marquette. And, and as the president of the, this university, what do you hear from parents? What do you hear from the students who are coming here? What's their uh, perspective on Marquette as a, as a safe place to, to attend school? Uh, they're aware that, uh, uh, that a school in the city whether that be Harvard or whether that be Marquette, is going to present some challenges in terms of safety and crime. Uh, the students need to obviously be aware. At the same time, uh, and I, I bless my predecessor, Father Albert Diulio, for this, uh, a serious effort was made uh, on a kind of in a three-pronged fashion to address crime and safety, uh, which was a disaster in the early 90s. I mean, it was topped off by the Dahmer case, which if you want to know what put us on the map, <laughs> and, it, and the Dahmer apartments are about a mile and a half away, so we had nothing, Marquette had nothing to, the institution that was always used in the national press to tell people where the Dahmer Apartments were, was Marquette University. And uh, that, was, that was a disaster. But we had real problems. And uh, Father Diolio did three things, I think, that really made a difference. Professionalizing public safety. <clears throat> Getting uh, a good liaison with the Milwaukee police uh, as focused in what was locally called the cop shop on 21st and Wells. And then rehabbing uh, the neighborhood and using that as a way to leverage out uh, a variety of criminal activities or nests that would be attractive for criminals. Uh, that was expensive, all of it, particularly the last item on the other hand, uh, coupled with, uh, uh, you know, initiatives also in the neighborhood by the neighborhood associations, uh, real progress was made. All you got to do is look at the statistics. I mean, it's unbelievable in that period. Uh, do we have problems now? Yes, we do. We have some. We don't have a lot, but we have some. Uh, where are the problems? Typically in the off-campus area. Uh, but uh, unlike a lot of universities, our neighbor to the north, UWM, we patrol our neighborhood. So does MPD. Uh, we work together. We share information. Uh, we have a great relationship with the, with the district attorney's office. Uh, we have a fine relationship with the sheriff's office. Uh, so a lot of different things uh, have been done and will continue to be done. Uh, to keep the campus environment uh, reasonably safe. Uh, and I think uh, parents, uh, basically I hear that parents uh, see this and respond very positively. Uh, we've, certainly we've not struggled, to my knowledge, uh, in this regard in terms of our admissions. Uh, we certainly did at an earlier point. Mm -hmm. Let me uh, ask you about the law school, the new law school, uh, because you've been the the guy who's been able to pick up the phone and have some nice uh, conversations with people who say, hey, I'd like to give you $51 million. That's, that's a nice conversation to, to have with somebody. Uh, what do you think uh, a new law school will mean for this university? Uh, I think it's going to be 
be a huge plus. I think it's going to give a, you know, just a building by itself isn't, you say, well, that's good. Uh, it, it's going to come down to what's, what's happening in that building. But one of the nice things about a building is, first of all, uh, you, you realize the school and, and the law school itself takes itself seriously. Uh, it's here to, to uh, be a serious player. It wants to give its students an excellent experience. It provides the resources to do that. And I think part of one of the things that I admire in Dean Kearney's vision is the, the whole aspect of public outreach. That the law school can be a real a player in the civic community and provide a venue, thank you Mike and all you've done, uh, for uh, public discourse, civil public discourse that rare commodity in our society. So I am, I am really impressed by uh, the vision for the school. I think it's going to uh, really help a great deal. I'm familiar with Georgetown Law School. I've been there for several meetings and uh, they, of course, built a huge uh, uh, addition to their plan. Uh, it, it, it sends the same statement. They're serious. And uh, the law school is not thinking small. It is, it really wants to get a great deal better. And that's the thing I liked about Hi Howard Eisenberg's leadership. That's what I like about uh, Dean Kearney's leadership as well. And I think that's a, a viewpoint that probably faculty and students alike share. Uh, we can and should get better. It's, uh, I've joked with some of these folks who are out there, they say, oh, more lawyers. We don't need more lawyers. I say, no, we're not focusing necessarily on more lawyers. We're focusing on better lawyers. Uh, but uh, believe me, those same folks, when they need a good attorney, <laughs> they're real happy that they're around. <laughs> My final question is one that uh, <clears throat> I guess is, a, I guess this is a perception question too. And the perception I get from talking to a lot of people on campus, people in the administrative ranks and people who are in the rank and file, there seems to be a consensus that they feel this is a crucial moment in Marquette University's history. Do you share that feeling? And if so, why is now a crucial moment? Well, I think I'm too close to it to really say. I mean, we kind of, in some ways, we keep putting one foot in front of another. We definitely are making progress. I am not content that we've made all the progress we, we should. Uh, we finished a very successful campaign. I found myself exceedingly eager to get into a new campaign because I saw the momentum that's out there. And I sense the eagerness that people have to see this institution get a lot better. Uh, we got to keep working on our values, you know, as we sort of lift ourselves in the uh, kind of world of higher education. Uh, that's, I think, imperative uh, because it's easy to get all focused on, well, we're the best academically and the rest doesn't mean anything. Uh, but it's, that's not the point. The point is really to do something that we can do uh, that uh, enhances the whole educational experience, uh, not only in terms of academic excellence, but in terms of uh, human excellence and attitude of service uh, that in the legal profession certainly has more than a little to do with pro bono law and, and the other things that variety of enterprises that this school is engaged in. We have to pay attention to that. Um, but uh, so that's, that doesn't quite answer the question, but um, I uh, think that's the best I can do. Uh, we'll let uh, others decide whether this is kind of uh, a, uh, you know, turning point in the school's history. I just think it's important we make, continue to make strong progress. And I sense that. I sense this kind of collective will to do that. Mm -hmm. Let's take some questions uh, from you folks. We'll begin right down here. Father Bob, uh, we hope you're president for a good many more years. <laughs> but when you, were, uh, when you became president, it was said in the press that you would likely, it was likely you were the last Jesuit president or would be the last Jesuit president of Marquette. Do you still see that? Do you see that as the case? 
case or are there other potential uh, executives coming up through the, the ranks of the Jesuits? Uh, I, when I said that, I did not say that I thought I would be the last, but I, I could see on the horizon that moment coming. We have 28 colleges and universities. We've got 42 high schools that we sponsor, uh, plus a number of these newer Crystal Ray schools, uh, getting chief executive talent for all these, and uh, what's a smaller body of American Jesuits is going to be challenging. On the other hand, there's, I, there's a number of people out there uh, that I think could take my job when the time comes. Um, there, it's not a terribly long list, but there's a lot of talent among the people that are on that list. <clears throat> uh, once a year I sit down at the request of our board and talk over possible uh, possibilities for succession. At the end of the day, it's not my responsibility to deal with my successor. It'll be ultimately the board's. And I think the outgoing president should leave the board quite free to, uh, uh, you know, make the choices necessary so the school can move to the next phase of its existence. No president does it all. Everybody's got blind spots. So you, you know, you then can take a, a look and, and address that. Uh, but are there Jesuits out there? Yeah, I think I think at least another round, probably. If I'm betting, I'll say there'll be a Jesuit successor for me. Uh, after that, well, we'll see. <clears throat> I can't control the future, even in terms of my own successor. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Questions? Well, Mike. I think we have to tell I mean, again, that's you talk about mission. If you're kind of doing things that really are a uh, conflict of interest and the, at the expense of students, you've got to pay attention to that. I mean, that's, that's true of any university, but it ought to be true in spades of this institution. We did, of course, as this thing uh, developed, we were not aware of problems uh, prior to where, uh, you know, the uh, – uh, US, the not the U.S. Attorney, the Attorney General in New York, uh, Andrew Cuomo, uh, began to raise questions, but we certainly took a quick look at things. We did not find, um, you know, any sorts of uh, material conflicts. The only thing that I think popped up was, uh, you know, some meetings that people had attended that uh, groups had it, and we put a stop to that, of course. But... Uh, uh, that was, uh, I would say that at this point we we feel pretty good about our record and we're, uh, we've been able to uh, dodge that bullet. You can never say never about this or anything else within an institution. These entities are complex, so you've got to keep looking at what's going on. Uh, I think there was, though, kind of a wake-up call in terms of the broad issue of conflicts of interest that uh, certainly I and my Jesuit colleagues as presidents, we've all paid attention to because uh, uh, while we certainly do not agree with everything that, uh, that Cuomo is up to uh, and would be prepared to argue at a number of points, uh, there's some basic concerns that were uncovered. Um, and, uh, but no, we, we, we're, I, I'm prepared quite easy to, in saying that uh, our situation is quite good at this point, um, you know, barring un so anything unforeseen. But we took a very close scrutiny of that. I, I asked Finance to uh, uh, really eyeball that. We also had in an outside consultant. Mm -hmm. Yes, Dave. Uh, well, some of the land that we bought relates to the uh, construction of the new engineering school. So, you know, whether you define it as a lot, 
uh, I'm not so sure. There's certainly one building that we uh, have targeted uh, what's called locally the Marquette Apartments to uh, as a apartment style probably or suite style uh, uh, residence hall. Uh, we could, I don't think we need a lot more residence hall space, candidly. I think we probably could benefit from some more apartment space uh, for grad students. Uh, you know, we're also taking some buildings out of the system that are owned by private landlords and that students have been using. So we have to pay attention to that as well. Uh, and uh, I would say the housing needs probably are more on the graduate professional student side than on the uh, undergraduate side at this juncture. Is the size of the student body where you'd like it to, to remain? Uh, certainly at the undergrad level, that's we basically have felt comfortable with this kind of range of we don't see uh, that our target there ought to be uh, intensive growth. Uh, we it's, it's we're pretty close to right size. Graduate and a professional level, there I think it's kind of where you can responsibly increase. Uh, you might well do that. Uh, looking particularly at master's programs uh, where there's uh, really uh, we have skills and there's a niche to be filled and we can meet that. I, you're getting a little more entrepreneurial in that area uh, because I think there's a number of things that interesting things that could be done. Uh, we'll keep we're, go we're looking at the doctoral programs. I think the big challenge right now on the doctoral programs is financing them better. Uh, financing the students better and uh, the programs better. So making the a strong program stronger uh, rather than I increasing the number of programs, although here and there I think we can look at that. Um, I think, you know, clear focus on, on professional ethics. Uh, any good law school should do that, but it certainly should be true in uh, a school like this. A, um, the sort of thing, the way students are dealt with, uh, they need to be well trained uh, as professionals. Uh, there was a day when this seemed to involve in the minds of faculty a rather, uh, uh, shall we say, traumatic way of approaching uh, the sort of paper chase mentality writ large or perhaps in that vein. Um, and, um, you know, one needs to remember that Students uh, are human beings, and need to, they should be treated as such. Uh, and and this is, I think, also important. It's definitely part of the university's ethos contained in the phrase "core personnels." Uh, people in the law school. Law school is one of our most pluralistic group of students. Uh, but uh, given their professional responsibilities, your your responsibilities at this point to become well-trained professionals, uh, we're not going to start teaching courses in world religion or some such in the, in the law school. On the other hand, to create opportunities for uh, spiritual development uh, that people can get involved with or not, whether they be Catholic or whether they come from some other group, that I think is important. And certainly the kind of emphasis that the law school has placed, particularly under uh, Dean Eisenberg and uh, and uh, and I think is is part of the fabric here is uh, encouraging uh, this responsive uh, that you know to produce lawyers who have a real sense of service to their clients uh, who are willing to uh, serve the needs of the poor as well as the wealthy uh, who have that sense that uh, really it's at the final analysis it's about 
ones in the uh, legal profession to promote justice and make the world better, even though in the nitty-gritty of, of legal, of real-life legal practice, sometimes one can wonder whether all this uh, can happen. So it's even defending, I think, uh, a sense of, of positiveness uh, and always in professional ethics integrity. Mm -hmm. uh, I think those are some things I'd say, Ginny. I didn't know whether you wanted to wait in them. Yeah. Some, I, there may be people here that would have yet better ideas than that. I, I expect Janine probably to have a few contributions. But uh, honestly, uh, I think, and that's, of course, one of the big reasons why I don't want it all to be just coming out of the president's office. <laughs> Aside from the problem that people can shrug their shoulders and get on with life, uh, you're going to get ideas from people who are dealing with the lived realities of whatever the discipline or profession is who will see ways that this mission can be implemented more deeply and that's what we want to encourage. I have a follow-up question I guess yeah. on this, um, Father Wild. The Jesuits have been involved in justice issues internationally since the beginning and my question is Marquette has developed some really extraordinary programs in South Africa and other places but um, in, in the, under um, your guidance, we now have an International Human Rights Center that we're working on. Where do you see Marquette engaging on social and justice issues internationally in the next 10 years? I think this is an area where we can become more of a player. I, I've been impressed. The initiatives have been coming strictly out of uh, such areas as engineering, nursing, uh, health sciences, dentistry, and out of the law school as well. Uh, it's um, and and I don't think I'm enumerating a full list of because uh, one of the things uh, when Provost Wake and I tried to figure out now what international programs do we have? It took us an amazing time because as soon as we thought we had a complete list, we'd discover more things coming out. And one of the things we knew we had to do was to coordinate the whole international outreach better. I think a common, the, uh, a, a joint reality of student interest and uh, uh, urging, uh, plus uh, interest of faculty and the school's ethos is going to tend to increase further our international presence. Uh, service programs is one way to do that, um, but uh, you know when even a targeted program like engineering, uh, the in the whole civil engineering area of of going to a country like Honduras or Guatemala and working with local people to complete a project that they really want to see happen, whether it be a bridge or a water a, a clean water supply. Uh, to do the design on that, uh, then to, with the help of the local people, to um, install the project, and in the main, in in the course of doing that, enable people, the local people and the and the students, to engage with one another. There's a tremendous learning experience that can open the eyes. I mean, it's one thing to go to China, uh, a city like Shanghai, and engage with. Uh, the corporate world, which is the corporate world in some ways like the corporate world everywhere in the world. It's another thing to realize that most of the people do not live in that level of society. <clears throat> most of the world live in the level of society of, of the uh, people who are rural farmers in uh, places like Guatemala uh, or in Africa or in uh, central India. That's the realities of our world. We need to be keep aware of that part of the world as well as uh, where all the corporate power and, and uh, political power resides. <clears throat> so I see that as, as something of a challenge in front of us, but I think it's an area that, that has energized the institution. I mean, there's initiatives taking place. It isn't as... Though Father President has uh, been the instigator of these initiatives, if anything, it's been to try to catch up and help to organize things so that uh, we do have procedures so that students aren't being put at risk and so, on, so forth and so on. Uh, it, but uh, 
Yeah, that's what I can say. I think you always have to work with, uh, you know, local communities. It's not a matter, and, and it's a very gringo impulse. We go in and we tell the world, rest of the world, now you got to do things this way, the good old American way. Hey, America, we're the country. Uh, no, you got to learn that we have a culture, they have a culture. In many cases, their culture is older than our culture. And uh, so we learn from one another, and that's part of the whole complex thing of it. Uh, and that's hard for us to do culturally, but uh, I think that's the challenge. Questions? <clears throat> Go ahead. Uh, that's a hard one to answer because it very much depends on the individual. I mean, the first task you have is that graduate degree. And, I mean, it's, it's the same sort of thing within the, within the law school, any of the, gra the graduate level programs. Uh, you, you need to assess that. Some people uh, are trying to manage that. They're doing a job. I do think there's a somewhat embryonic, but I think good movement to organize a grad student association. I don't know whether you're involved in that or not, but uh, we met with uh, uh, several of the leaders of this effort and are, you know, are certainly supportive. Uh, there are graduate school uh, student issues that should be addressed institutionally uh, that we have uh, candidly paid a lot of attention to. I think we've done better with the two professional schools on the broad uh, group of grad students uh, working in the various grad programs. Uh, so that I think is a challenge and I think it's probably going to be the students that kind of point out some of these things. Um, I think there's also a social dimension. It can be very lonely doing graduate studies and to try to within one's department and within one's, uh, the whole, the milieu of graduate students to create a social, a more social environment. The school ought to be, try to be helpful on that. I think the present uh, graduate dean uh, sees that. Uh, there ought to be ways, too, that graduate students who wish to can plug in on, on the sorts of outreach programs that the institution have. These tend to be at present more dominated by undergraduates uh, and and probably would be, you know, I mean it's the the undergrad experience is quite different than the grad experience. Grad experience is very focused. Undergrad experience by design is much more general as well as focused on that particular major that you did. Uh, and so uh, it's you know, becomes kind of more part and parcel of the undergrad experience to seek out broader experience and more a characteristic of grad and professional schools to focus so that they can really excel in their, uh, their chosen field. Um, but within that, you know, life exists outside the library and the classrooms and, uh, and the you know, there ought to be ways that we can find. And again, the best vehicle may well be uh, a, a functional and active graduate student association that then we, the uh, school's administration could work with productively to help attain some of these things. Uh, people need to, who want to take leadership should be encouraged to do so. <clears throat> As a first law student, Paul Rod, I'm very excited to look at your building, especially bigger lockers. I can put a plug in there. Uh, in light of the Virginia Tech massacres, I'm wondering is there a, a campus wide policy? Let's say right now, God help us, a government attack somewhere on campus. Is there sort of a communication network? You know, a, yeah, a it's a. Uh, that's. Uh, we had been working prior to that to emergency crisis planning. Uh, recognizing that a host of possible crises could happen and 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 putting together a plan seeking to 
to deal with a variety of scenarios, appointing a clear uh, leadership take charge team, and uh, then testing this in both tabletop and an actual simulation this last summer. Uh, and that'll probably have to continue to have that testing and, and simulation exercises so we're sure that with new people and new, uh, you know, you can continue to respond. Uh, Virginia Tech, of course, was a further wake-up call to, uh, um, we uh, uh, felt at some levels quite prepared. We would not have, for example, waited to give a, a, a student alert uh, the way Virginia Tech did, given the fact that, you know, you had murders in, in the residence hall. I mean, we give alerts on, on lesser things. We don't want to do it with too great a frequency or you get into this wolf-wolf phenomena. Uh, but certainly for something like that. And the only way to do it with contemporary students is multiple venues of communication. You cannot depend on people, I mean, landline phones, forget it. Cell phones, you may or may not be able to, you may not even have the current operative cell phone number. So you really use email, text messaging is, is currently being explored. Uh, whatever vehicle, the, uh, the communication network of those plasma screens and all the rest, to get the word out to a, a substantial number of people, you'll never get it out, I think, to everybody because, so you get it so that they in turn can notify others uh, that such and such is happening because it's, a, it, and it's tricky. We also have to lockdown capacity for all our buildings that can be done quite easily from a central source. Uh, and then we have a, a public safety, we have, li that has leak good liaison with the police, the sheriff's office, uh, FBI uh, district attorney, as we talked before. So uh, we think that we are, you know, reasonably well prepared. You are never fully prepared for anything like Virginia Tech has gone through. Uh, but at least I th I'm comforted by the fact that I know we would have, uh, in something as dramatic as a residence hall murder, uh, that would have been communicated as soon as we learned of it. Any remaining <clears throat> questions here? Well, in that event, uh, I'm going to be mindful of what Dean Kearney said at the beginning of this uh, <laughs> event and give him the chance to have the, uh, the closing comments here. Afterwards, um, uh, my motivations were entirely innocent. It was not based on some concern that I would need rebuttal time. But we do have something we would like to give you. I referred at the beginning to the conversation that we printed with you in the Marquette Lawyer magazine. It was only a somewhat awkward moment about a year and a half ago when I went to Father Wild and I reported that. Uh, Julie Tolan, the Vice President for Advancement, and I had concluded that we should swap the order of the next two covers. Father Wild was about to be on the next one. We thought that putting Joe Zilber uh, on the cover might be a good idea. <laughs> Father Wild, uh, ever the consummate fundraiser, uh, pretty much ordered me to do so. <laughs> All right. To the extent I had any doubt on the matter. But we do think it's a signal honor to be on the cover of the Marquette Lawyer magazine. Uh, so much so that I've not even put myself on the cover uh, in the years since I became dean. And so uh, we place them up on the walls. We have uh, in various rooms uh, rather oversized versions of them. But then we give the person who's on the cover um, this is undersized, um, a somewhat <laughs> undersized version of this, uh, and uh, so uh, perhaps you can find a spot for this. O'Hara Hall is not a big building, but uh, we will have the replica here, uh, but perhaps you can find a spot for this uh, somewhere uh, in O'Hara Hall. So. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah, it was fun to do that. You have anything else you'd like to add, or? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Easiest rebuttal I've ever dealt with. <laughs> Anyhow, thanks uh, very much to all of you for coming today, and again, thanks to uh, Father Wild. Thank you. Thank you, Mike.
Yeah. <clears throat>